Hey, it's Roy Richardson, your new friendly neighborhood tech truck maker tonight. We're going to talk about how the art of self-promotion. Because I'm like, I, you know, when you make a video, how do you get people to come watch it? And there's no better person to talk about this than the awesome Stephanie Garcia. <gasps> Yay. <laughs> how you doing tonight? I'm doing well. I'm doing really good. I'm like, oh, it's Tuesday. <laughs> Tuesday. Yeah, I know. Well, for me, Tuesday is important. I go live every Tuesday at 9 p.m. Eastern. So it's it's been my night. I'll hit three years in April of going live consistently. So uh, I get pretty excited. That's that. amazing. Kudos to you. You yeah. got to celebrate that. I I mean, I for one have not always gone consistently. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I've had a couple interruptions of service, but for the most part, I've been here. So anyway. That's Let's good. talk. I, you know, the thing is, you know, I, I, I met you in person at Creator Camp, but I've been a follower of your channel already. I was already a subscriber. Seen you on live stream pros so many times to talk about different topics with Luria. So uh, definitely knew that you were just amazing at branding, at, uh, at working with influencers, and then, you know, the concept of micro influencers as well as, you know, just talking about how to get your message out. And so, I know that my community, a lot of us are starting out or we, we reached a level where, how do you get people to watch our videos, you know? And so I wanted to kind of just start with that. And I have some, I have some thoughts, you know, so, you know, just kind of tell me your thought process. So, you know, a lot of this is like ways to self promote. And these are kind of like the cliche ones that everybody says, I'm sure, but, you know, definitely move us beyond this, but, um, yeah, we know one of the things I do is I try to make sure I'm consistent releasing content. Yeah, every week at, a, at about the same time, so people can kind of expect it if they've started following. And and then I know that collaborating with other creators and using keywords and tags so that your content is searchable. But you know, what other thoughts do you have on that? Yeah, when I think about creating content and promoting it from self promotion, it's yeah, especially as a live streamer, you have to tell people when you're going to go live so they know when to show up. I, I feel like some people still feel like, oh, I'm randomly going to go live and just expect people to to show up. That's that's not a thing. I'm the type of person where, you know, I'm a single mom. And so very much everything has to be on my calendar. And if it's not on my calendar, it, it just basically doesn't even exist. So I, I find that pre-promotion is is definitely one of the most important things to have out there. And then once you do have your show, obviously having a nice stream deck where you can tell people that you are live, that's always generally helpful. And then after the show, I feel like that's usually where the magic happens because there's so much digital confetti that you could create afterwards. So whether it's repurposing your video into a blog post, into short form video, or taking comments from, you know, Marcus and Lala and like actually repurposing it into say like, hey, this is what you missed on the show right? And it's like, here are the gems that Marcus and Lala wrote down. Those are things that you could do to help you promote your show and get people to be like, oh man, it's it's different when you watch the replay versus when you're live, right? So those are those are, those are some things that you could do. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So um, speaking, let's just kind of check out some of the folks that are out there now. So um, Philip, how you doing out there tonight, sir? Mommy, God, Hello. Lala, excited. <laughs> you're so early in the morning. Yeah. Well, it's not too bad. It's like 10 a.m. in the morning for her, so it's not too bad. Yeah. Also with things, Matt Haas. Hey, Marcus. Marcus. Lala's, Lala's saying hi to us. Yep. Hey, Lala's saying hi to Philip and Matt and everybody. Lala, Philip, hey, everybody. Homemaker hey. with Denise, hey. Hey, Trollmaker stuff. Yep. Yes, so a solo mom myself, I, I, I need to be preached. <laughs> Everything as much as possible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got you. Yeah. You know, I, I think I think at the end of the day, there's so much that you could do to promote your content and put out there. And I think oftentimes what most people don't realize is you still have to measure how successful that promotion strategy was. And then you get to realize, okay, me posting this on Twitter really didn't drive any traffic whatsoever, so maybe I should stop doing that, right? Or me posting this into a Facebook group isn't really getting me the attention and the traffic that I want, so I'll, you know, you start to tick things off your list as like, hey, I'm not gonna do this anymore. But I think when you're first starting out, 
you really own your own content distribution strategy as far as like where you want your content to go in what places and how often that you're actually going to do that. So once, once you have like those different distribution channels and if you're able to systematize it, that's gonna make your life a whole heck of a lot easier. Eventually down the line as a content creator, you'll wanna hire like an intern or maybe even a VA to help you with that. So, I mean, we could geek out about that. <laughs> All right, um, you know, explain, explain your, your concept of, of digital confetti. Cause you were kind of talking yeah. about that, you know. Yeah, so for me, digital confetti is oftentimes people create content and then they'd say, okay, I published it, now it's live. And then they just put it on like this shelf where it collects digital dust, right? It's like, okay, I've done it. And then I'm never gonna talk about it ever again. And it's like, no, you, you shouldn't do that because what we all know about social media is that 100% of your followers did not see the Instagram post that you posted today, right? <laughs> So there's only a small sliver of people that actually saw it. So you taking that same post and repurposing or, or sharing it again, like seven days later, you might actually just get a different audience based on how you edit it, the copy that you use, the hashtags and all those different things. And so digital confetti is really taking your big pillar content, your big piece of content, and then repurposing it into like, let's say a blog post, an audiogram. Uh, I like to turn it into bite-sized pieces or like the digital confetti that I could sprinkle all across the internet. Those would be things like my short form videos, my tweets, my LinkedIn. Like even today, I don't know if you saw it, but on Facebook, <laughs> on Facebook, I was talking about how one of my clients is knocking it out of the park because she's booking speaking engagements. And I didn't want it to be like, oh, here's me pretending to work at my desk. I actually had this video of me I went to Comic-Con back in like 2017 and the Dragon Ball Z booth was there. And so I turned into a Super Saiyan and I was like, that's actually the feeling of what it's like to, you know, kick butt for your clients. And so I posted that video and that actually was a scroll stopper. I got people to stop, look and listen to like what I was promoting. And that's just my point. It's like, just because it happened in 2017 doesn't mean six years later, <laughs> right? Lala probably never saw it before but that's like her first time seeing it. So I have like this database and I see someone mentioned Notion. I put everything in my content assets database and be like, oh, what's a fun thing that I can use? It's kind of like your greatest hits album, right? Like what was the greatest hit that I could repurpose because each new day that happens, I'm probably getting a new follower or I'm being introduced to a new audience. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it definitely does. <laughs> I like that. Um, Little again. <laughs> I know. I, I gotta. I gotta. I'll fix it. I'll fix it. I'll, I'll I need like that next. Alice potion. <laughs> I'm using all the ecam effects tonight. We're we're fixing it. We're gonna make. We're gonna bring. It I love closer. it. There we go. There we go. There you go. No, 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 no. So, I usually had that window, so it's like, all right, let me bring it back. So, um, so speaking of questions, we had some questions. Like one of one of them was from Lala. How do you do self promotion without making it look like a hard sell? So that's yeah what <laughs> <laughs> well lala here's here here's here's what i usually like to tell people i i think of my content as like in what bucket do i want it to live in and so it's called the aces formula it's a c e s and so a stands for authority authority is where like you are the go-to expert about all arts and crafts and making and crocheting and all this other stuff. Like you are the authority and you are being quoted. There's an example of you being on somebody else's show talking about this, or you're giving a product review about something, but you are basically the authority in that space. Then you have your other bucket, which is like connection. And connection is where you're, you're telling kind of like your hero's journey of how you got to where you are or how you're just starting in creating your content journey. So that way people can connect with you and get to realize, you know, you're not this person that they can't relate to. So think of like connection as what makes you relatable, right? And then E, engagement is where you really want to answer questions from your audience. You want to get their opinions. Hey, if I talked about, uh, okay, I just came back from CES, right? Would you be interested in me talking about this, this, or this? And then you can have them vote on a poll. So that would be like an, an example of engagement. And then S, that's your sizzle. That's where you're gonna sell. Right. And so when you think of the art of self-promotion, 
it's not sell, sell, sell. <laughs> what was that one guy's name? Jim Cramer? Sell, sell, sell. Uh, it, <laughs> it's, there's this progression in it of people trying to get to know you, right? And so if it's a low ticket item, an offer that you're putting out there, right? Like, let's say like you wanted to join the digital confetti community. It's this much. Um, I would do like A, C, E, S. And I would say join the community. But if it was going to be like, hey, you need to be in my seven day certification program, that is like, that's like a five figure number, right? The way that I would lead up to that campaign promotion, it would be A, C, E, A, C, E, S. Because people have to get to know me a little bit. And during that time frame, I could do, I'm gonna throw another acronym at you. I could do my 10 by 10 formula, which is like top 10 frequently asked questions about my certification program. And then top 10 should ask questions, questions that people should be asking about my certification program, right? But that's the whole thing as far as like, how would I promote that campaign? So it's not like sell, sell, sell the whole entire time. Does that, does that help? Yeah, definitely, definitely like that. I just, we're gonna have to go back and replay the acronyms later. So everybody go back and rewatch that. That'll be good for watch time for me. Um, yeah. <laughs> So what's, you know, can, kind of tell us your origin story because I, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated about your content creator journey. I know that you were in sales and marketing and then, and then definitely, you know, spun off and then you have all your great courses, which we'll talk about that later. Um, and just how did you get your start in content? How creation? did I? Get... Yeah. What's your origin it's... story? My origin story is so way, way back in the day. I was actually doing human resources for a tech company. And I was the type of person where I knew everyone's employee anniversaries, their birthdays, all that type of stuff. And I was very crafty. So Lala, I was the type of person where I had like a cricket and all this other stuff and I would make handmade birthday cards. So I would give it to the employees and say, you know, happy birthday from the human resources team. So happy to have you a part of this. Well, it just so happened that one of the people's birthdays that had happened, her name was Aparna, I actually really remember this, but Aparna had said to me like, Stephanie, these are so beautiful. You should actually sell these. And I was like, where would I sell this online? And so I started researching where could you sell stuff online? And this was back when Etsy first started, <laughs> right? Where Etsy was all about handmade things. And so I created my very first Etsy store and it's called Island Blossom. You could, I think you could actually find it too. It's called Island Blossom. And I was selling things like handmade birthday cards, will you be my bridesmaids cards, wedding invitations. Like, yeah, Lala, I like, I was yeah, glue and everything, all the things. But then what I realized, Roy, was, well, how do I get people to actually find out about my store? And so I started learning about blogging and how do you create blogging? How do I take pictures and how do I write copy? And it was so interesting because even before I worked at that tech company, I worked at, uh, was Auto Trader? Do you know what Auto Trader? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so Auto Trader was like this leaflet magazine where you would say, I'm selling my pickup truck. And you really only had like 90 characters to talk about how you would sell your truck. So that's all I knew about copywriting. Anyway, fast forward, I was working HR and I was hiring for the marketing department and I realized that they were looking to have an analyst, a marketing analyst join their team. And so I said to the, you know, <laughs> I, be, I was like, I was like, Hey man, I know what you're looking for in the person that you're hiring. I've personally been learning about Google analytics and blogging and all this other stuff. Would you consider me moving from HR over into marketing? So I was there for about like three months and then they shut down the whole, <laughs> they shut down the whole department. Yeah, that was my first time getting laid off at a tech company. Wow. And I clearly remember having, like, oh God, it was like office. <laughs> I had a cardboard box and I walked out and I looked up at the sky and I was like, well, what am I, what am I going to do? Do I go back to HR where it's safe, right? Because I had been doing that. I went to school for psychology. Or do I keep going down this path of marketing? So eventually what had happened because I made these really great relationships with like the VPs and the executives, cause I was the one working in HR, they recommended me to work at another uh, social media agency. 
fast forward there, I was in the ad agency world probably for like a decade and a half. And then I had my daughter and then I realized, oh, Roy, I can't work 50, 60 hours a week and bring another human being into this world. And so I realized, hey, if I could do this for Nike, Sephora and Clinique on how to build a brand, you know, how to promote yourself on social media, I should be able to do this for myself. And so I left the agency world and then I realized like everyone was calling themselves like a social media strategist and I thought, well, how do I separate myself from the sea of sameness, right? And that's when I realized instead of telling people what it is that I do, I wanted to show them what it is that I had to do. And this was back like 2016 and I decided to do Facebook Live. And don't 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 hate me on this, but this was before Ecamm, but I used OBS and I was like, oh my God, I, I used OBS and I had this green screen and all this other stuff. And I was showing people how I would do a social media audit how I would create content, how I would blog, how I would design things in Photoshop. This is like before Canva. And then eventually at the end of it, I yes, I would get some clients that wanted to work with me. They're like, hey, Stephanie, we would like to hire you as a social media consultant for our, our brand and whatnot. But then what started to happen was people were like, hey, how are you doing this live streaming thing? So now this gets us back up to like, 2016, 2017. And I think at that time, Leslie Samuel, then mm -hmm. he then uh, demoed Ecamm Live for the very first time. And I was like, wait, what is that? And so I made the official switch from OBS to Ecamm. I somehow got like Glenn's email and I would, I would email him like, hey, you know, I want to do this thing where I'm remote live producing. How do you do that? He's like, that's not a thing. Like, I want to make it a thing because I have clients that were asking me, Stephanie, can you live stream on our behalf? And so that's how I've really been. That's how I went from <laughs> HR to Etsy, to marketing, to social media agency, to then live streaming and being my own content creator. Wow. wow. And, and, and you mentioned that, you know, definitely having your daughter and then 50, 60 hours. That, that was one of my questions. How the heck do you juggle all of this that you do? Because, I mean, you're traveling everywhere and... Uh, you are helping people plan events and you are doing stuff with different creators and different brands. How do you manage all that? It's, I yeah. know a lot of us as creators, we'll, we work a full-time job like you're doing and then we do content creation and we got family and everything. So, you know, that whole time constraints thing, but you seem to have mastered it and, and I'm still working on it. So how, how do you oh. do that? Oh, thank you. I mean, that, that really does mean a lot. You know, I think where i really excel the best is knowing systems like i need to have like a routine and so there are certain things that i know about myself where i cannot work five days a week it, it's just not a thing um i could work four hours a week or not four days a week up to 20 hours just realistically because otherwise my energy level starts to starts to get a little crazy so that means I have to pack in as much as I possibly can energy wise from the time that I drop off my daughter to when I need to pick her up. So I'm done by 2.45. So that's really kind of like how my schedule is. But to make it all work, I tell people that my content creation strategy is a video first strategy. So I tell people the first thing that I do is I'll always do a live stream. Now for this live stream, I might not always have like, you know, live streaming pros numbers where there's like hundreds of people on there. But my whole thing is I just need to get it out first. I don't know what it is about being a content creator, but it's like sometimes I just have this urge where it's like I have to create. I haven't created something for myself. It, yes, I know I have to create things for clients and whatnot, but I think spiritually I have to create something for myself, right? And live streaming is like the first deliverable that I could get out there. Once I get that done, now that we have things like AI, I take the transcript from it. This is where we get into the digital confetti. I take that transcript, I turn it into a PDF. I use a tool called Magi. And Magi is basically, it pulls in all the different AI tools like ChatGPT, Dolly, and all those other stuff. But I say like, hey, create a blog outline off, off of this live stream that I did. And then I say, okay, great. Now let's write the blog post. And then so the blog post starts to happen. So that's like one piece of content right there. Then I'll say like, okay, 
let's, um, I use Descript and I'll clip out different parts of the show that I know did well because the people that did show up will say, oh my gosh, that was a gem. And so I'll highlight it, right? You could, in Ecamm, you could do markers and then I'll create that into a short form video, send it over to the editor and then they start chopping it up. So let's say, let's say those are just like the two things that you do, right? You do live stream, blog post, short form video. What I tell people is if you're doing something like this, where it's like, you know, maybe like a 30 or 45 minute live stream. Seriously, I could create 94 pieces of content from that. Because again, most people, you know, you talked about it earlier about watch time. Some people may only watch like the first five minutes. They might not watch all 10 minutes. And so every piece of digital confetti that you put out there, it feels like it's relatively new. And so for me, once I create those assets, I put it in a social media scheduling tool and I just have it set on repeat. So for example, we're live today on, on Tuesday. I could tell you by tomorrow morning, if you sent me the video, I could already have the blog post done, right? And then I could create, let's say five short form video clips. Then those five short form video clips for the next five Tuesdays, I could talk about this one episode, but that doesn't mean that on Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday, I didn't do another show. And then now I'm creating more content from it. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, definitely, because, yeah, I mean, we're using things like Opus Pro and things like that to, yeah. to slice up things or the script, and you go through and you try to break it up into make shorter videos. And so, yeah, I mean, it definitely makes sense. I know that makes a lot of sense to a lot of the, the community on here. So that's awesome stuff. Yeah, let's uh let's check on everybody out there. I know we've got some things <laughs> out there, so I, I keep seeing things light up, so I guess we should see what everybody's talking about. Uh, let's see, Anna, yeah, yeah, Marcus, Anna, Anna. Yeah, this sweet friend, um, yeah, Dan says, shoot, how could I be late? <laughs> Stop it. it, you've been doing your own thing, I see you, friend, you're working hard. You gotta get that idea out of your head or it's gonna haunt you. Yeah. That, yeah, that is so true. I, I already lose lots of sleep <laughs> because I wake up at four o'clock in the morning, I'm like, what can I do next? What is my next content creation idea? Um, and, and then what can I do for the show that I'm going to have tonight or tomorrow and that type of thing? So I, yeah. I obsess over it. I don't know if you do or not, but uh, let's see. Uh, George says my audio is much lower than yours is. Okay, well, I got to fix that. All right. Um, thank you. Yep, I should have been paying attention to you guys. How about now? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully it's good. Iconic journey, definitely. I wanted to use OBS back then because it was free, but I couldn't understand it. So Ecamm has been an answered prayer. Yeah. yeah. Ecamm is my jam. So yep. definitely. Uh, thanks everyone for being here. Don't forget to give some love to Roy and Stephanie by hitting that like button and sharing the awesome live stream. Thank you. Let's see. I've got some more questions for you. So here's one from Anna. Um, Anna asks, should you self-promote on your personal pages or create pages in different platforms only to promote yourself? Oh gosh. I, I would say use your current platforms. Uh, well, okay, so let's say for example, I have a Facebook personal profile and a Facebook business page. There are, are advantages to having a person, personal profile and a business page. Let's start with personal. So personal, I feel like most people really kind of want to get to know you for who you are. And who you are is more than just your business, right? Who you are is comprised of your values, your belief, your attitude, your hobbies, who you hang out with. The other nice thing about this, and I say this to you as an entrepreneur, is that when you're, in, when you're engaging with other people in Facebook groups, you're most likely commenting as your personal profile. So let's say you say something that's like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that you could do this with Ecamm. I find this all the time. I'll like, oh, you could do this in Ecamm. People will go back to my personal profile, see what's happening in my Facebook cover photo. I'm like, oh, I didn't know that she did that. And now they have something else to talk to me about and build rapport with. So that's the nice thing about having a personal profile. And yes, I still do talk about business there because like I said, it it's a part of who I am. Then I have like a Facebook business page. The Facebook business page also has its advantages. Obviously the ones being, you could run ads on it. Uh, if you wanted to keep like your family separate from your business page, you could totally do that. It's also super helpful if down the line you wanna work with brands because brands want to see, you know, do you have an audience? 
Do you have engagement? What kind of content are you creating? If they, if you're creating, let's say UGC content, which is like user generated content, they'll most likely want you to post on your business page because then they could put paid media behind it and work with you that way. So there are advantages to having both of them. I would say at the end of the day, even if you just made like a Facebook business page and only talked about sell, 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 I don't think you're really gonna like grow that audience right? Because people really want to get to know you, what it is that you do and how you're helping them solve a problem. Yeah, definitely agree with that. Um, another question somebody asked is, do analytics play a part in deciding how to promote your content? Yes, I would say an absolute yes. And this is one of those things where, you know, when I was, when I was working a full-time job and being a, a content creator, I was just kind of like, just put it out there, whatever it's out there, people will find me and that'll work out. I think now as a full-time content creator, I am very much paying attention to my analytics. So one of my favorite things that I've been experimenting with is short form video. Short form video comes in all different shapes and sizes in the sense that it could be a direct response video, which you would use for ads, or it could be like a user generated content video where you have storytelling in it or just like random clips, like the Opus clips, right? And <laughs> I don't know how, if you guys are looking at any of your analytics, but I find that clips from live stream interviews where it's like, oh, this is a gem, that doesn't generally have the best retention rate. It just doesn't. Like after like the first five seconds, it drops, right? However, if I'm saying like, here's my trip to Rosarito, you know, this is how you spend a day in Rosarito and be back before sunset that storytelling narrative, I'm able to stretch that retention a whole heck of a lot longer. And so I'm learning that as I'm looking at my analytics of like what's working and what's not working. And then it's also helpful to know like how I structure these short form videos varies per platform. So that Rosarito example that I just told you, like how to, how to spend a day in Rosarito and be back before sunset, that crushed it on Instagram. And so I take notes of like what made it so, so shareable, right? It was like one of, it was one of my uh, Instagram reels that got the most shares, the most bookmarks, the most comments. And I, and I, I boiled it down to, it could be the fact that I tagged two other collaborators in there. I natively used some of the features on there. I did that. Like I have like the whole script of how I shot it. And then on TikTok, it probably got like half half the views and half the comments that it did on Instagram, but still better than what I generally get on TikTok. And then on shorts, I didn't even, I didn't even push it up on shorts <laughs> simply because on my YouTube channel, it's mostly about live streaming. So for me to talk about Rosarito, I thought would have been like completely out of left field. And then on LinkedIn, like it bombed, <laughs> it bombed like completely. And I think that's really helpful for us to know, right? if I'm creating this piece of content, what's the best platform for it to live on? But even if it does flop, I'm still okay with that because there is no failure. There's only feedback. And so for me to get the feedback of what's working and what's not working is always going to be helpful. So that way, when I coach my clients and my students, I could say, you know, just be mindful of, you know, this might take off on a certain platform and it might fall flat on another platform. So I definitely take a look at the analytics one thing that I've also learned from like my really good friends, like Owen Video and Sean Cannell, is just remember, just again, just because you published it the first time doesn't mean that you can't make tweaks to it to see if you increase that retention time. Because anytime you publish social media content out there, it always goes to like a little test pool, <laughs> right? Like the first 250 people. And then if you're able to keep that watch time, then it'll go to a bigger pool and then a bigger pool. And that's basically how they test out your um, virality of your content in that sense. Wow, that's that's some just fantastic stuff. Um, let's see what else we got going on here. Yeah, hopefully my volume's happy now. <laughs> Yay! All right, let's see. Anna saying ha ha ha. Hey, la la. Everybody saying hi to each other. Yay, everybody. That's so cute. I love that. <laughs> Mary Lou says she's gonna need this workflow. Oh, <laughs> Mary Lou, we need to we need to like create content together for sure. Yeah. Uh, hey, all right. Dan says some people quote Brene Brown. I quote Stephanie Garcia. 
<laughs> Thanks, friend. That means a lot. Hey, Florence, how you doing out there? Yep, that's right. Oh, let's call this. Hey, David, how you doing out there? That was very informative. Thank you for answering my questions. That was, that was your Let's question see if I earlier. Get... <laughs> um, there is no failure, only feedback. Love yeah. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Definitely. Uh, definitely. Oh, gosh. Great minds think alike. Mommy God, that was a powerful quote. So, yeah, definitely. Definitely agree with that. Now, uh, I don't know if everybody knows because it's it's been a while. So you wrote you were co writer for social co author of social media marketing. Is it time to revamp that book, or are the principles in that book still mostly true, or has everything done a one eighty and it's time to to do volume two or or revise it edition? That's I mean that's a really great question. I think. When my co-authors and I first wrote that book, we definitely wanted it to be timeless in the sense that no matter what social media platform happens, right, you should still know the basic principles of psychology, really, right? Like what makes content engaging? And so one of my favorite books, if you guys like to read books, is uh, Contagious Why Things Catch On by Jonah Berger. And he shares his, his formula called The Six Steps. And he says, you know, if your content is shareable, if it, you know, it's, it has emotion, it has practical value, public value, it has storytelling, and it has triggers, right, S-T-E-P-P-S, -P -P <laughs> then that's what makes your content super helpful. And so when we wrote that book, ta-da, that one, uh, we were very cognizant of what are the psychological human behavior that still is built off of social media. So again, I'm gonna geek out with you. So another book that I love is is called Hooked by Nir Eyal. And he talks a lot about like when you are creating any type of social media platform, content, short form videos, it's how do you make your product, your idea, your community, a part of someone's daily habit? Cause that's how you keep them coming back. So just like you, you have your show every Tuesday, people keep coming back and they might not realize it, but it's probably because when Marcus gets to say hi to Anna and then right, everyone comes, they're unconsciously getting that dopamine hit, that dopamine, that oxytocin, that serotonin, those endorphins that they only get at this time. They're like, why is it 6 PM every Tuesday? I get all freaking excited, you know? Or Lala's like, oh my gosh, it's super early here in the Philippines, but I'm just energized. And it's because your show has become a trigger. It's become a daily habit. And so those are like the concepts that we talk about in the book. It's not just about the social media platforms. Same thing I always tell, um, Dan, it's not always about the gear. It's about how you get the gears working up here. And so that book, even though it was written in the middle of the pandemic in 2020, sure, it could be updated in the sense of the platforms. But as far as the human psychology behind it, it's all there. Like even like Mary Lou, the whole workflow process, I still go by my video for a strategy no matter what. Awesome stuff. So question here. Um... Nope, wrong one. Let's try this button. There we go. Uh, if you ha so, somebody asked if you have a channel, are we a brand or just an influencer or both or even neither? This is such a philosophical question for me. Dan will tell you this about me. Like Stephanie never just answers the question. <laughs> Here's the thing. Despite the internet, despite LinkedIn or any of the social media plat platforms you've always been an influencer. The, when you go to Starbucks and you order your drink and you order it out loud and you're like, oh, hey, I'm gonna have like the soy vanilla latte. That person behind you is like, maybe, I've, maybe I need to try that. Or maybe, you're unconsciously influencing people every time that you send an email because you're influencing them of like, oh, maybe should I open this email? Should I work with that person? And so I do this thing with my NLP group where it's, <laughs> It's the map to billions of basically, it's your influencer map of you. Like any person that you've ever talked to, you have influence. Uh, when you send out an email, you have influence. When you're texting, texting someone, you have influence. Now, if you were to say this, like in the world of you having a YouTube channel, are you a brand or an influencer? You could be both. Uh, what I, when I think of brand, I think of company logo. That's basically how I think of it. When I think of influencer, 
any person is a person of influence, right? Like me, like my daughter influences me, <laughs> right? So it, it's up to you if you want to say that to be an influencer requires you to have so many followers. That's that's you if that's if your belief, <laughs> right? Um, but I will say that there is a difference between being an influencer and a content creator, right? An influencer to me is someone that has a huge, large following and can influence people by saying, you should buy this mouse. Like I was influenced by Doc Rock, like literally. He's like, you need to get this <laughs> MX Master 3 for Mac, right? It is a good mouse. But yeah, that's totally, that's totally him. Uh, but a creator, that's something different. A creator is someone that just has this innate need to create, you know, and it's not necessarily to influence other people. It's just like the, it's like this art, this magic that, that just, ah, it needs to, <laughs> it needs to get out of us. And we are so in tune with our craft. And that's why we take a look at things like our analytics and all that other stuff. Um, and even as a creator, especially on YouTube, you are creating a community where people can come together and share like-minded interest. So an influencer, creator, brand, those are all like three different things to me. How do we figure out what is a good fit for us to use to market ourselves and our content? What's a good fit for us? Is, is that like... What content type? I, I guess they're they're asking. I, I don't. I guess it's kind of like what uh, I don't know. What social? I, you know, maybe like for example, what social media you'd pick? You know, for example, me. I oh, prefer, a channel. Yeah, maybe yeah. for me, I like YouTube and I, I use um, Instagram. I used to use Twitter, but X is pretty much. You know, I had twenty uh, two thousand followers on on Twitter, and and now it just doesn't matter anymore. It seems it's like nothing has any influence anymore over there but i still get traction on instagram so i do love that so that's kind of the the second place i'll end but i guess this person's asking you release a video where's the where's the place where you go market that video how do you figure out uh, what's the best to fit? start promoting it yeah yeah okay so obviously and and i could speak to this on my end so when i do a video obviously when i first started i would i was known for facebook live because Facebook Live was like the big thing in 2016. And then I could cross post it into groups. And that was really great as far as growing my audience. Six years later into my journey, I really wish I would have listened to my other friends like Roberto and Sean and all of like, Stephanie, you should have just started on YouTube. Um, and so now these days, I'm very much YouTube first as my uh, video distribution channel. And then other areas where I'll repurpose it is going to be Instagram because I feel like I go to enough conferences and people want to get to know me and Instagram is where they kind of like get to know my feel. And then Facebook is another place for me. TikTok does not like <laughs> my live stream, my repurposed live stream. They just don't. Like it's not a thing. Um, and I think it's probably, and this is me just predict, making my own predictions, and it's because I'm not a Gary V. It's not like I'm not a big brand name, so they don't care that much. And so I have to rope in uh, that audience by telling much more broader stories versus very niche down things for the show. But to answer your question as far as like what channels should you focus on, um, I would first go where your audience currently exists, right? Uh, so for me, it was always going to be Facebook. Like I said, every time I went live on Facebook, someone would DM me at the very end of the live stream and like, hey, how do I work with you? So that that's why <laughs> when like Sean and Roberto and the rest of the crew are like, you should be on YouTube. Like my friends are not hanging out on YouTube. Like my business is not coming out on YouTube. My business does come from LinkedIn, which I find to be very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, babe. My little one's here. Hi, cool. Uh, we we okay. can always add oh. more guests. Um, no, you're good. Who are creators that you're influenced or inspired by? That's a really great one. Um, and that's because I've been diving into different areas of content creation. So for example, there's this one gal on TikTok and she's, I think she goes by, hey, I'm Tran. And she's very, very specific about UGC direct response videos. Mm -hmm. So if you're the type of person where you're like, hey, I wanna work with brands and I wanna create faceless content where I don't always have to be on camera, right? But I could do unboxing videos. Those are people that I would definitely follow. Um, 
there's this other friend of mine where he was um, Amazon finds. He's so much fun to watch on Instagram because he focuses mostly on Amazon. Jenny Hoyas is another great person to watch if you're interested in doing YouTube shorts because she could definitely turn in, turn anything to go, turn any video and make it go viral. So her whole thing is that she's not Mr. Beast because she doesn't have Mr. Beast budget, but she is Mr. Least, or that's actually what her audience calls her is Mr. Least. So that's a good one. Um, another person that I have been following just to like understand how they're creating content. I don't remember her name, but she's the founder of Viralish. So she has this whole course about, she's not about creating content to build a brand or to be an influencer. She creates viral videos because she knows that she'll make money when brands are creating that one minute video in between content. So she makes her money off of in-stream videos. So her whole thing is, I don't wanna make short form content because short form content is too short for an ad to play. So she's fine with making like three minute viral videos. And she's the type of person where she'll do uh, spoofs or pranks. And again, that's not for everyone, right? But she has it down to a science. And I just love, I love understanding people's frameworks and what works for them in different genres. And I feel like that's where some people, they're like, oh, well, so-and-so is doing this. I should do that. But the, it has a different purpose to it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it definitely does. Um, yeah, let's just check. Let's check on everybody out there and let's see how they're doing. <laughs> so, all right, let's go. Uh, uh, let's see. I just met Stephanie here, and I already love her. Count me as a big fan, too. <laughs> What's the call? <laughs> Uh, pour it in a cup and hand it to me easy peasy <laughs> so yeah youtube is the biggest the most eyeballs that is definitely true uh yeah. says i know i'm going to come across as stephanie's biggest fan but it's only because i live near her and i've gotten to meet her and emma and she's just incredible offline support great people Aww. so definitely i i, I want to show you this is a quote from creator camp that you asked us this was a question you asked us in the class that we had and and, and i still think about this question and, and everybody should. How do you want people to feel after watching your video? That yeah. That is probably one of the biggest questions that we all need to ask ourselves as content creators. I mean, you want to kind of elaborate on that and, and just, you know, go deeper? Yeah. With so usually when people say, Stephanie, I want to start a live stream, I will always say like, okay, for what purpose, right? Like what would that do for you? What would that do for the viewer? And more importantly, how do you want people to feel after they watch you? And so a lot of times people are so focused on their niche. Like I want to talk about <laughs> the best mice for your computer or whatever. And like, that's their niche. But really what, what gets people to keep coming back because they want to get to know you is going to be your personal brand. And so some people, they want when someone watches like their video or their live stream to feel like, oh, wow, that person is so knowledgeable. They're super smart. They're super professional. Or that person is unhinged. They're hilarious. They make me laugh, right? When I tell people about Lights, Camera, Live, and even Digital Confetti, I am adorkable. I am a full-on dork, but I'm also adorable, <laughs> right? Because I'm, I'm cheesy, and I'm going to tell you, like, funny little stories and whatnot. But I try to make it so that way people feel like you could ask me anything and I'm not going to make you feel dumb for asking me a question, right? Like one of my, my very first website was called HeyStephanie.com. And the reason why was because when I would walk around the office, they would say, Hey, Stephanie, how do you do this? Or Hey, Stephanie, how do you, that's how I first started blogging. And so how do you want people to feel after they watch your video is what do you want them to remember you by, right? So we have people coming here every Tuesday at a certain time and it's because they get that dopamine, the oxytocin, that serotonin, those endorphins. You give them that sense of belongingness. That's something else that you could write down. I want them to feel like they're a part of a community. They have a sense of belongingness. Some people like, uh, I like watching, to uh, what's it? Tony Oliveira uh, on YouTube. And his stuff is like, it's unhinged. It's funny. It's working. I don't have to think about it. It's not way too serious. You know, he's, he's one of those YouTubers that I could just play in the background and be like, okay, you know, I didn't miss anything. Whereas if I 
if I was watching like doc, I have to pay attention. Cause if I ask, wait, can you say that again? Like he'll come after me in the comments. <laughs> Sometimes I just like, okay, whatever. I'll just timestamp it. <laughs> Yeah. But you know what I'm saying, right? Or I'll yeah. ask a question then, of course, because Dan's like on every single live stream. He'll be like, oh, yeah, this is what he means by that. I'm like, okay, great. Or sometimes he'll just text me like, thanks, Dan. <laughs> yeah. um, so let's let's talk about all the places people can find you because I, now that, you know, some of my community hadn't met you, I don't know how that's possible, but um, now they met you, now they now they have to go and know all the places to find you. Of course, um, you have your YouTube channel, uh, Lights yep. Camera Live. Um, and then as well, you have your uh, website, uh, which is also lightscameralive.com. So that's definitely uh, probably definitely a great way to find you. You're also on Twitter, but here we are on your website. You know, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? Yeah, you know, I would say LinkedIn is probably, I'm there on LinkedIn every single day. Instagram is where, you know, th those are usually just for like casual conversations right? Instagram, I feel like our casual conversation, like you see me at the beach with my daughter. I was like, Hey, I'm trying to unlock this Instagram live. <laughs> right? And then everyone got it in December. It worked. Um, it worked. We yeah. It so, everybody. Hey, you're welcome. Everyone. Uh, on LinkedIn is usually like business, right? It's business focused. If, if I get a DM like on LinkedIn and you want to connect, I know that you want to be there because you want to forge a relationship. You want to do business together or there's some type of capacity. I might know someone that like, oh my gosh, can you please introduce me to Dan Roth? I'm like, oh my God, I would totally do that for you, right? So, <laughs> and I'll make those, I'll make those LinkedIn introductions. <laughs> and digital confetti. Oh, you're muted. Let's try it with less mute. Sorry, I have a dog. He was gonna help join the show. So I said, don't don't do that. So um, so this is your, you know, digital confetti and, and definitely people want to get involved and, and go deeper with you and, and get guidance from you. Is this probably the best way for them to do that? I would say so. Yeah. It, it, it's like having my brain on speed dial literally because the app is, so the community, there's like a mobile app and it's really cool because like Michelle Williams or Dan Roth, sometimes they'll just message me and because I have my phone by me, I'll just message them back. I'm like, Hey, I love that you're doing that. Here's a quick idea. So as you know, I'm like a, an idea generator. If you're like, hey, Stephanie, I want to be launching a book. I'm like, great, cool. Let me introduce you to this person or that person. And Digital Confetti is really where I'll, I'll tell the crew, hey, I'm testing this out. Or I was one of the first people to find out that so-and-so an event was looking for speakers. And so I would post in the group. I'm like, you want to speak at an event? This is how you apply. And then I even put like little nuggets in there and I'll say like, this is the person that you need to connect to. Like, I know you want to apply to it, but you really actually need to get to know this person and be a part of that circle. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, definitely. Um, let's see, we got some more folks out here. Uh, Lala La La likes adorkable. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so does David. They all like that. Yep. That's me. <laughs> uh, yeah uh, dan says you st we still need to work on your linkedin yeah he's uh, he's got like thousands upon thousands of followers yeah yeah he's uh, I'm, I'm going to get dan on here we, we've been planning it for quite some time to get him on the show and then the night he was supposed to be on i had to cancel due to a, a family emergency but he says we'll we'll start my <laughs> mommy guy says she'll start her linkedin course after um she takes dan's has <laughs> start my linkedin after she starts dan's course uh, exactly. Then, or, you know, don't even wait for his course. Just book a time with him and say, because he'll give you a lot of jam-packed information. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, li yeah LinkedIn is definitely kind of nebulous to me. So, uh, Stephanie, thank you so much for being on the show. Any final thoughts we should send out to the community here? Oh, you've been amazing. Thanks for having me on here. It's, it's always nice to do like these interviews because I'm always on the other side and like I get to talk to the crew. Uh, but I love hearing what questions you all have about being a content creator and systems and workflows, I will say, have been my lifesaver. I'm definitely not one of those people where when I'm creating content, I don't start from scratch. I like having formulas. Which, that's why I have like the video script maker that will give me all the hooks that I need to. Uh, ChatGPT is nice, but I find that it, it could also 
make you go down a rabbit hole, right? So I'm very, very disciplined in my process and my workflow systems. And if that's, I mean, yeah, if you ever want to talk about that, we could totally geek out on that. Um, but it's very much in my head, I follow the 94 ways to repurpose a live stream. And I'll know, Roy, like, oh, okay, I'm on step five. Great. Is this good enough? Should I keep going to 94? Is this good enough? And let's let's say step five is good enough. I'll put it in my notion of like, this is where I stopped. So that if one day I'm like, oh, I don't know what to talk about. I could go back to my notion and be like, oh, well, you stopped on step five. You could still go. <laughs> you could still go to 94 and then go about it that way. Oh, fantastic stuff. Yep. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, just the, whoop, uh, put it in a better place there. Uh, Credence said, Mikey said, I, I had my first YouTube partner manager meeting today. <sighs> wow. That's awesome. That sounds amazing. Kudos to you. Congratulations. Uh, and then uh, Dan says, la la, just reach out. We can jump on. I'll see, yep. you don't have to wait for a chorus. Just get that man on speed dial. <laughs> yep. And uh, let's see, mommy guys. Oh my, we're at the top of the hour already. Time flies so fast. We're having fun. Yeah, Stephanie, this was so much fun, and you dropped so many nuggets of information. Thank you so much for sharing all that wisdom with us. I know that, and you have so much more. I know, like I'm just amazed at, at just everything. You know, oh man, the, I, it's just like wow. That's just you. You obviously eat, sleep, and breathe this uh, because, and and just definitely an endless fountain of creativity with all the things that you come up with. So, mm -hmm. and definitely um, just everybody, if you're not following her channel at a minimum, please go do that. Uh, go hit subscribe on her channel uh, and then definitely reach out to her and, and definitely get involved with Digital Confetti so that you can kind of get yourself, if you can't really figure out what direction you should be going, she can definitely lead you in that. So definitely awesome there. Thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, let's see, you're I'm supposed awesome. to do this call to action things. Let's see. Okay, first of all, I'm supposed to tell people to subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Stephanie, thank you again for being on the show. And good night, everybody. Let's see. Now, here's my outro, y'all. All right. So, YouTube says this video, this next video is amazing. So, you need to go click on that and watch that. I'm sure my audio is way too loud. But go, <laughs> go click on that video. YouTube says it's amazing. So, watch that next. And thanks so much for being here. Bye. Yay.